in the kind of environment we live in, either you have no friends and only very perfunctory relationships, or you have, or you're like isolate, you're physically isolated, but you have these deep internet relationships. Um, And I think that's sort of like an interesting, like, what is the value of someone who like, you don't really go deep with, but like, you have a lot of physical experiences with like, you're both, you know, like you're maybe you always see them at church or like you play basketball with them or something and you have that kind of like regularity and the relationship is less based on this confessional sort of thing that millennials love so much um, and more more based on like physical movement somehow or like involvement in a project that's bigger than oneself. Yeah. Something Uh would you like to know more? Hello, everyone. We are very excited to be joined today by Catherine D, aka Default Friend, one of the world's preeminent internet experts and historians in internet culture. She is absolutely insightful. She is a journalist who contributes to quite a few different outlets. She's a blogger. She's just very insightful and fun to talk with. And she suggested something that really piqued our interest when we were scheduling this podcast, the durability of mediated relationships. Catherine, what do you have in mind here? Yeah, this is something I I think about a lot, like how much intimacy can be fostered just completely over a screen or on on the phone. Um, And it's sort of an open-ended question, but it's something that I I think about a lot. Um, I guess maybe a more fun way to ask is like, how real are are internet friends? Mm -hmm. It's such a good question. Which is to say that I think that the different contexts in which we communicate with somebody access different parts of our brain. And to an extent you are literally communicating with a different person. So in a way, a multimedia friendship can be much deeper than a non-multimedia friendship. By this, what I mean is the person who talks with Simone over the phone versus the person who talks with Simone in person versus the person who writes emails to Simone versus the person who writes, you know, one way we used to communicate when we were apart from each other was through journal posts. So Simone would write eight pages of journals about her day. And then I would like annotate that afterwards as like, oh, you did this. This is interesting. And each one of those, I feel, is talking with a slightly different person living in the same person's head. Yeah, actually, so there's, there's a, and people think we're really crazy for doing this, um, those who watch video of our podcast, because Malcolm and I are in the same house, but <laughs> we, we always do podcasts from different rooms. And that's actually like very much a good illustration of how for us, we, we will actively mediate our relationship through a video call um, just to get into a certain different mind state. Um, because I, for example, think very differently when I'm alone in a room than when I'm in a, in a room with a person, even if it's Malcolm, who might as well just be me because we're the same person. So I think but that's what, that's really interesting. What are your thoughts on all this? Um, I, I think that you can actually get closer, um, in, in mediated relationships than you can, um, in physical world ones. I mean, part of that is just that you act, you know, you actually can spend more time with the person, even though it's a different type of time. Right. Um, and there's, I, I think actually you could be more deceptive in real life than, in cyberspace. In cyberspace, you could lie about, right, like your profession or your hair color or things like that. Um, but you there's like the, emo- the you can't really lie emotionally as much, especially after you hit a certain amount of time with someone. And I feel like with a lot of like digital relationships, if you really, if you have a high volume of communication, which a lot do because we're always sort of ambiently on our phones or ambiently online, um, you could actually start to merge with the other person. And I don't know if that's healthy. That could be actually very toxic. But I do think um, if not like durable, like you actually can get closer. Um, And yeah, I just think I just think about that a lot. And like what happens to relationships where you have that like closeness and then you bring it into the physical world? Does it change? Well, so something that, that, you know, we've talked about in other places and we might do a full episode on this is the way that online environments are structured changes the type of interactions and views that will be espoused in them because it naturally leads to specific types of status hierarchies within those communities. So you take a something like Reddit, right? Where the most average liked opinion is the most likely to be seen, meaning you're going to get very normy, inoffensive, sort of left-leaning opinions. Whereas you take something like... Um, 
4chan, where it's the most stimulating opinion is the most likely to be seen. So you're likely to get the most offensive opinions rising to the top. Or you can contrast that with something like Twitter, um, where, you know, for something I wrote to be seen, it, it actually helps more if somebody disagrees with it and, and, and ratios me, re, you know, retweets me, um, than if they like it in terms of getting it in front of other people. So you end up with, you know, pointlessly offensive takes often in that community. Um, but in a different way than they're pointlessly offensive on 4chan where they're just meant to be mentally stimulating on 4chan, like the maximum emotional response instead of the maximum disagreement. Or um, And so within these different communities, I wonder how you think about different environments, how they change, whether it's romantic or friendships that form in those environments. Yeah, that's actually, that's like an interesting point because I think like when it, there's like the public facing expression, right? On the Twitter timeline versus in the Twitter DMs, and then there's one-on-one -on -one DMs, and then there's group chats, right? And in all of those situations, there's different incentives. But I think it's, I think we could think about it in the same way as, um, you know, the difference in an office versus someone you meet up, you know, through a, a club or hobby, right? Because mm. you're, sh there's, there's, you sh have to bring a different piece of yourself to that environment. Um, when I think about like, online relationships I, I guess I've like often and even when I've written about it I think about it in like the like one-on-one -on -one, right um and somehow carrying someone with you everywhere but I haven't thought about it as much um in these sort of more public environments and that's a that's a really it's a really good point because then you're constructing a character and like maybe actually you can't form deep relationships in certain public venues in the same way you can't necessarily a Goldman Sachs office, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, is there some particular experience that you experience that is particularly evocative around this question? Um, yeah, I mean, I, and this, this, it's interesting because like, I've, I've read a lot about like other people experiencing this too. Um, like talking to someone so much that like you almost um, hallucinate their presence hmm. or like being on a phone call where like you feel like you're in the same physical space um and it's it's funny there's one study that i bring up a lot and i can't seem to i was looking for it today but like, there's um three different women it was an israeli study who were in these digital relationships and they started like hallucinating the presence of their lover and wow. um the their touch and it was considered a psychotic symptom but, I, but when I read this, I always thought, like, is it a psychotic symptom or is there something about like, filling in the blanks in our head or something, right? Like, there's another study that was done where in-game, like, eye contact um, affects people the same way as, like, real-life eye contact. Or, like, oh, wow. like eye contact is, like, sub date, like, whatever would represent eye contact in, like, the particular game, which I thought it was, like, really interesting, right? Like, there is some, phys like, physiological thing happening there. So I, one thing that I'm also thinking about here that's like this, this conversation is changing the way that I think about catfishing. Um, like part of me is, well, you know, as long as people never meet in person, you know, is catfishing really that bad of a thing? Because I think that the emotional connection that many people are building is very real. Even if like, I think I'm talking to a 24, four year old, you know, five, nine, Gorgeous woman. Great fishing case. I, I love true crime internet stuff. <laughs> okay. Um, where, a guy was dating this, this it was catfishing this young girl. So he was pretending to be a young, you know, sniper in the military. Um, and then he got in a fight with another guy who wasn't catfishing the girl, but who he knew in person. Oh. And so then he goes and he kills the other guy in, in, in real life. So he can have this girl who he's catfishing, even though she thinks that he's 30 years younger than he is. Oh, and then he finds out that actually she was like an old woman and, and had been catfishing him the whole time. Um, and so it can hurt people, Simone. Um, okay. But I think things... that's, that's a good, that, but I, I agree with you, Simone. Like I, I, this is something I've written a lot about. Like, I actually think lying has, is different on, in certain online social contexts, hmm. um, because it can be expressing like a greater emotional truth that you can't express because you don't have body language. Right. And so maybe there's certain kinds of lies that are done because they're like socially expedient or you want clout or whatever. But then there's lies that you have to tell because it, it there's some sort of shared narrative or there's some sort of shared world building that's inherent in not having a physical space with someone. Hmm. Yeah. 
I also like speaking of the physical barrier here, like whether or not, you know, the problem is that you're actually, you know, a 72 year old male or whether the problem is you are an AI. Like one thing that Malcolm and I talk about a lot because we really want our kids to be exposed to ambitious, smart, really well-informed friends is we're sort of thinking, okay, well, should we just set up our ki our kids with AI friends that are like really smart, really just ambitious? Simulate just, their peer network. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just that like, you know, a lot of their friends that we try to set them up with are like literal AIs that they just develop close friendships with. That we'll tell them that they're AIs, but honestly, from various like simulated boyfriend girlfriend scenarios that seem to be out there now, I think maybe if you that don't doesn't shame those types of relationships that they won't see them as lesser. Mm -hmm. uh, but then the question is, if they don't see them as lesser, would they still be motivated to form real connections to people and build real relationships? Right. But what, I'm, I'm curious to get your thoughts, Catherine, on like how you think about mediated relationships where there isn't even like the ability to ever meet uh, a carbon-based consciousness. No. I am on the fence about it because I don't really think it's that different than the attachments people have to like fictional characters. Mm. Um and, you know, there's a lot of, a lot is probably a stretch, but there are people who have um, romantic attachments to fictional characters enough totally. that there's such a thing called like, fictosexuality, which is distinct from like, robot fetishism, right? Which is like, people who fall in love with their real dolls or whatever, um, right? It's like its own thing. Um, and it's, that's, I mean, maybe in that case, like the AI is, it, it's better, you know, like if, you, if it's go, if it's something in us that causes us to have these relationships anyway. Um, I mean, here's a really corny, like terrible thing. But, you know, what if like, Dante had a Beatrice AI, right? Like, you know, what, would that he, have made... Well, he practically did. I mean, he, he wrote so much fan fiction about her, basically. Right, exactly. <laughs> ex ex I, to me, there's no there's no difference between like his sort of obsession with this woman he saw twice. Yeah. Um, and then someone sort of like quote-unquote like falling in love with an anime character a Harry yeah. Potter character oh my god I love that you just drew that comparison yes because there is no difference and uh, that would absolutely destroy so many of my fancy literature friends so thank you <laughs> <laughs> so, something I'm wondering if you've ever dug into in terms of internet history around this sort of stuff when I hear these stories a community that I used to really love to dig into when I was younger I, I don't know how young you are but I think I might be a bit older than you was the Second Life community and their relationships that they were forming in that in that environment. Um, and so many of the wild stories of that community just seem to mirror what people think is like a new internet phenomenon. Like, oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> like the meta stuff, right? Well, no, I remember one story of this group, a couple met on Second Life and they got married and then they realized they didn't like each other in person, but they stayed married living in the same house, but would only talk through their computers. Um, and well, but this sounds like a I modern love that. no, that sounds so romantic to me. Are you kidding me? Yeah, yeah it might have been World of Warcraft, it was one of the two. That's where like all the weird online stuff used to happen. Yeah, it's it's and it wasn't even really new then because like people would do the same kind of stuff on multi user dungeons. Um, which is again, they're 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 role they're basically role playing games, but they're text based. Um, no, I, I'm, I'm those in the culture that was in them. Yeah, um, it was a, a lot of some of them were there was like gameplay, but a lot of them were like sort of like chat rooms or like chat rooms that had a like collaborative storytelling element to them. Um, and there's, you know, the very similar story that I like I return to all the time because I think it's so interesting and I think it's still applicable today. Um, it's in either Life on the Screen or The Second Self by Sherry Turkle. This um, couple falls in love, or so they think, over a multi-user dungeon. So in this sort of like role-playing chat room. And they meet in person. There's no chemistry. And then when they're interviewing the, the male half, he, he says, you know, well, I looked through our chat logs and I had projected connection and romance that wasn't there. Hmm. And it, and there's something like he like interpreted he'd misinterpreted the text, um, and I just to, I know that sort of sounds like contradictory to everything I just said about e romance and like digital friendships, but I think because we're so toxically plugged in, that actually prevents that kind of misreading, <laughs> or at least in, 
ideally it will it would prevent prevent that but i thought it was just so interesting like we are it is like interpreting people and text-based medium is really just like interpreting literature um, people will have like, radically different ideas about the poem or even a short story and see things that aren't there and it's especially reflected in fandom when it's like, people will see a whole homoerotic romance hidden in the text and you're like well what the, what are you talking about? like where'd you get that but they really believe it and they'll give they'll have receipts at the wazoo well and i think yeah. it's one of the special things about mediated relationships is depending on how you're coming into them, you can take the most generous, charitable, inspiring, whatever interpretation of someone. And I think it's a lot harder to um, take a pessimist, a more pessimistic approach. Whereas in person, I think that like people end up taking more pessimistic interpretations and also people's, what we would call overlay states can more easily pollute the situation. Like if you're hot or tired or hungry and you're together in person, like it's more likely to lead to negative interactions. Whereas if you're interacting asynchronously with someone via email or, or even just text or whatever, like you're probably not going to be interacting with them when you're at this like really low point with your mood. So also the interactions you have are probably more likely to be like a little bit more mentally sound and stable than if you guys were together in person, I'm thinking, but maybe that's not the case. I also imagine like we live in an age in, in which people have some serious anxiety problems um, that I'm like, I'm, I'm one of these people, like it's, it's hard to go outside or it's hard to make friends and interact with people. And so I also imagine that mediated relationships are kind of a solution for a generation of people that suffers from more mental health issues than I mean, previous generations. The ability to access mediated relationships is what causes those anxiety problems because hmm. people are allowed to indulge in that. I think that's partially true. And I also think like, um there's in in person there's sort of like you could have a lot of like shallow connections that are like satisfying and like serve a purpose um whereas in the kind of environment we live in either you have like no friends and only very like perfunctory relationships or you have or you're like isolate you're physically isolated by these deep internet relationships um and i think that's sort of like an interesting like what is the value of someone who like you don't really go deep with but like you have a lot of physical experiences with like you're both you know like you're maybe you always see them at church or like you play basketball with them or something and you have that kind of like regularity and the relationship is less based on this confessional sort of thing that millennials love so much um and more more based on like physical movement somehow or like involvement in a project that's bigger than oneself yeah something i'm also i'm thinking about mediated relationships in the past and i'm thinking like my um my maternal grandparents met once at a USO ball in Paris, right as the as World War II was ending. My grandmother was French. My grandfather was Anoki, and Not French, they Russian. She sorry. Lived. Well, yeah, she was Russian who had yeah fled to <laughs> Paris. She called herself. She, she wanted to be French so bad. So you're 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 disgracing her memory here. How dare you? Um, but anyway, so like after they met. Um, they exchanged letters for a long time. And then eventually they just decided to get married based on these letters alone. So this is a totally mediated relationship. And my grandmother moved sight unseen to a, a, an outhouse, one bedroom farmhouse full of a family of people and my grandfather to marry him in Oklahoma. And it was a very rough ride for both of them, I think, but they stayed married throughout their entire lifetimes and had a pretty successful marriage. And one thing I'm wondering is tactically speaking, could mediated relationships be a solution to some market failures in the dating world where if, if, if we, if more people committed to developing a strong connection and aligned incentives and goals via a mediated relationship and committed to marriage like before ever meeting in person because it seems like the visual emphasis seems to be what kills people's ability to connect right now especially if they want to get married because they're so focused on visuals and like instantly am I super hot for this person no okay I'm not even going to consider them even if everything else on paper is perfect and we'd be actually really good long-term partners I'm wondering if forced commitment based on a mediated relationship that does work really well can produce good long-term relationships what do you think um, so I actually did this. I married an internet stranger after very no. little time. Yeah, yeah. So I'm on actually in my second marriage so <laughs> right now. Congrats. Which, which is more a, a, a better, I don't want to say better, a different situation. But the reason that my first marriage didn't work was because 
there wasn't, we, you know, we experienced like, not to air my, my dirty laundry on a podcast, but we had like, some personal tragedies that were like insurmountable that I think would have been surmountable if we had more community support and were more grounded mm. in a culture and community. Um, and so I think what you know, the failure of relationships, it's so much of that is your environment. We, I think we, we lasted a very long time, you know, for, especially for the strangeness and unique circumstances, mm. but it just couldn't, it just couldn't work because we were like an island, right? And it, mm. we both have a very good relationship with our family, but families, but he, you know, he's from a different country. We were living in a state that I didn't grow up in. So like my community there was not as which strong. Of, which of the relationships was the one that was the short online relationship first? The first uh, was- my, my first, my first marriage. The first um, one. And, sorry, that yeah, wasn't yeah. from the story. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, sorry about that. But, but my, yeah, my second, my, now I'm on my second marriage and it's, it was, formed much more traditionally like certainly more like in-person time and like more integrating into one another's you know real world lives and it's I don't think that it was that I met that what ruined ruined or ended my first my first relationship wasn't the that it started as a mediated relationship rather Mm. it was we weren't part of a broader cultural fabric and there's certain problems that like, I mean, it's total amicable, totally amicable split, right? But it's just, there's some things you really need help. And if you don't have that help uh, or like the role models, it's so, it can be really hard. Well, how did you try to address that with the second relationship? Well, with the second relationship, I, it's now there's like more of an emphasis of like making sure that we're grounded in a community and that we're not, so we're not like, you know, striking out on our own in a city where neither one of us has family or connections. I think all of those things become really important um, as you get deeper into a relationship and as you mature into a relationship. Um, Mm. Just, just being part of something, right. Is it, it helps a lot. Um, But yeah, I think just being, we were like, we, we didn't really know our neighbors. We weren't really in a city. It was just, we were just so isolated. And it was, it was, I think, more problematic um, than either one of us expected. What I like there is you're saying it doesn't not work. And that if you were maybe to combine people starting relationships in this mediated way, but then when they physically come together, being supported by a broader culturally aligned community, it actually could work pretty well. Um, yeah, I, I, but, but it's I part think of a like, complete breakfast. but that would change how people date period I think um there's just something where it's like things are too like piecemeal almost Mm. um where I think like it it could just it's just really it's just really hard to navigate the world as a single unit Mm. that's kind of floating in this ether you don't really know where you belong and I think not that's that won't kill every relationship but that will put stress on a relationship especially if you encounter things that are outside of your control that's fair. Yeah. Huh. Any other thoughts, Malcolm? On, on, well, okay. I mean, a, a direction we could go is this, is pseudonymous relationships that are seen in things like the furry community. I don't know if you have any thoughts mm-hmm. on that. Oh, that's, that's interesting where it's like, they don't, they only know one another through their yeah. persona. Yeah. And I think they, well, they're, or they originally meet through that. And I think you see this in many fan communities where people will engage through fan characters. You know, My Little Pony, they might have like, I, I don't know what they would have called them, pony sonas or something. Um, and, and, and that's how they would have interacted with each other. Because I think even in the furry community, you probably find out pretty quickly who these people are. Like, I, I doubt there's as much mystery. Whereas I think in some of these fan communities, another great one is that, that fan community around that book about cats. Um, where a lot of people would identify as like a a, a cat Sona thing. Um, there's some YouTubers who who talk on this stuff, but yeah, yeah. So that's that's interesting. I'm I'm trying to think back to my own experiences. I was really into text based role playing, um, so it's not quite the same, but it's 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 similar. And I would do like historical role plays. You know, I'm really interested in the 1780s. You know, this week, so I'm going to create a, a world around that. Awesome. And there. There would be like romance elements sometimes. Um, and even I'm trying to think of like ones that like when sometimes these these role plays will go on for years, right? 
and you'll be in these narrative relationships and it but it doesn't really impact your physical physical life and it's I don't think I was I was whatever affection I myself had and not my character had is not for the person controlling the avatar it's for it's for the the writing and the character they've constructed and what I've projected into that character in and that that world and I would guess that our personas may be similar because there's some element of separation and it's there's some sort of like role-playing element there and it feels it feels like it's kind of separate whereas the difference between something like that and second life it tends to be more like your avatar in second life is actually more like your username on twitter um, and there yeah. can be a separation there but it's not as often as there is in like something that's consciously a, a role play mm. um so maybe, it, and it, I guess I'm not in the furry community and I haven't talked to people in the furry community. So I guess it could actually go either way. It could, it depends on how they're using the fursona. Yeah. So this, this role-playing thing that you're talking about is very interesting. Um, so how do you choose the people that are in these persistent communities or can people just like drop in and you engage with them based on the quality of their writing? Yeah. Um, I haven't done it in a really long time. I think the last time I like actively was role-playing was 2007 but people would just it was pretty um it was a pretty small community um so people would just find like forums and then there would be some sort of like gatekeeping or like hazing that would happen <laughs> and you you know you would get accepted in the community or filtered out um and then people would like gravitate towards one another if they had compatible writing styles and there's usually like a start like a universal style guide for whatever forum or maybe chat room it depended on you know you could do it on different platforms um and then every if it was like a literary role play everyone would write as though they're writing a story and it, it could be published in a book and then there's other types of role play where like actions are in asterisks or parentheses and usually those are quicker moving they're probably more likely to be in a chat room um yeah and it just it's just a, a chemistry thing um some you know Sometimes you have chemistry with people. Sometimes you don't. That That's so interesting. Interesting. Did you ever meet any of these people in person or were these relationships always pseudonymous? Yeah, I met one woman in person. I met her when I was like 11. And um, then I, I lived in um, her city very briefly and we, we met up in person. And then we were friends until I was like, I don't know, like 25. And then I just stopped using Facebook. And so then we stopped, stopped being friends. <laughs> That's that is it. actually really, uh, I, I think it's, it's an underrated element of friendship um, that there are some people that you can only be friends with through certain channels. And this doesn't, this is not exclusive to mediated relationships where you like primarily you had started out there, but there are literal in-person friends that I can think of who, because I refuse to use like iMessage after I change my phone number and I can really access like iMessage, th they just refuse to communicate with me on any other channel. So we're just not going to be friends anymore and i feel like there are some people who can only be contacted through very very specific platforms and that's it's an interesting thing it's like they don't exist outside of them um and it's weird to live in an age where things kind of work that way i it it is weird but also i wonder like how different is it from you know a work friend who like can't make the transition to a different mm. kind of right like you're my you're my facebook friend and just whatever you, i i don't like talking to you on iMessage so that's the that's that <laughs> Totally. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Oh gosh. Okay. This was really, really interesting and really, really fun. And I know we're, we're running out of time, so we will let you get back to your life, but Catherine, thank you so much for joining us. We would love to have you back on at some point. You are absolutely brilliant. Um, and I hope we can talk again soon and everyone else, please tell, tell us all where we should find your work. Um, you can find me on Twitter at D or at x <laughs> at default underscore friend or my blog is just default.blog great thank you very much yeah thanks